from training camp, and all eyes are on Philly. Even though Ben Simmons wants out, Doc Rivers and the Sixers aren't giving up. Plus, Doc sets the record straight. And if Simmons is traded, we'll dig into where he could go and how those trades could look. Plus, former NBA champion and current featured player on Dancing with the Stars, Amon Shumpert, is with us. Also, who would be the greatest QB among NBA stars? Go long. We've got you covered for the next hour as the jump starts now. And NBA champ Kendrick Perkins and the host of the Low Post podcast, Zach Lowe, are here to start things off. We have some more great guests stopping by later in the show as well. But we have to start with the ongoing game of chicken between Ben Simmons and the 76ers. After Woj's report yesterday that Simmons won't show up to training camp and doesn't intend to ever play for the Sixers again, Doc Rivers appeared on First Take today and gave his goals for Simmons in the coming weeks. Take a listen. It was a good conversation, um, and, he, and he gave his reasons, which we obviously didn't agree with. Um, but, you know, Stephen, I, I think in sports, and you've been around it a lot, um, there's been so many times that this has happened that hasn't been reported, and the guy comes back. So, listen, we're going to go through it. Um, we're going to always do what's best for the team. But I can tell you up front, we would love to get Ben back. And if we can, we're going to try to do that. You know, Ben has a long contract. So it's, it's, no, it's in our hands, and, and we want him back. So Doc still has hope for Simmons to play in Philly again. Perk, do you? Yeah, you heard what Doc said, Cassidy. And one thing we got to do is always believe Doc Rivers. We know that he went down to Dallas to DeAndre Jordan house and moved some furniture and held him hostage <laughs> when he thought he was signing with the Mavericks. You don't think he'll do the same with Ben Simmons? And Doc said something key, right, in that, in that interview that he did this morning. He said he's under contract with us for four more years. So as bad as Ben Simmons don't want to be there, and he's telling the world he don't want to be there, guess what? Philly don't have to trade him. That's what a lot of people don't realize. Like, he doesn't have to get traded. Philly doesn't have to trade them if trade Ben Simmons if they don't want to. And I feel like the reason that Ben Simmons is not going to Philly is because he know that once he steps foot into that facility, once he sees some of the guys that he all cool with, once he start getting that good energy and good vibe, his mind is going to change. So with that being said, he's trying to stay away for that particular reason. And I understand it, but Philly don't have to trade him. Yeah, and, and Daryl Murray has shown that he's fine being in uncomfortable situations in the past. But Zach, the Sixers still haven't made a conference finals since trusting the process. Is the Sixers title window at, window rather, at risk if Simmons ends up being moved? Depends what they get for him, but I think the title window stays open as long as Joel Embiid is there and Joel Embiid is healthy and an MVP candidate. We have to see what they're going to inevitably turn Ben Simmons into. If it's a rebuilding kind of trade, if it's young players and picks, yeah, they've kind of stalled out unless they can turn those young players and picks into another star to pair with Joel Embiid. But it's too early to start having that title window conversation. Right now, the conversation has to be, as Perk said, can they repair this situation at all, if only to get him on the court so the other players don't have to be asked about him every day and to help Ben and the team rehabilitate his trade value so that they can see what the market looks like three, four months down the road. Maybe a team disappoints and gets desperate. Maybe another star becomes unhappy. You never know what's going to happen in the NBA. Yeah, and if they keep Simmons, Rivers recently doubled down on not concentrating on shooting with him. So we'll see how that develops. As far as where Simmons could end up if they end up moving him, the Warriors owner Joe Lacob was asked about a Defensive Player of the Year candidate to avoid tampering charges and told the San Francisco Chronicle this, quote, In some ways, it doesn't really fit what we're doing. He makes a lot of money, and can he finish games? I don't know. He's very talented. The problem is, we have Draymond. Draymond and him are very similar in the sense that neither one really shoots and they do a lot of playmaking. That's one issue. The salary structure is another. And Zach, first things first, are you surprised Lake of even said that out loud? No, oh, I'm not a little surprised, bit, but I'm look, glad I, that he did. Oh. Zach, go first. We'll get to you in a second, Perk. Zach. 
I, I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, I'm a little surprised they tried to do this silly tap dance around the tampering stuff. I think he, he, he is if we don't know who he's talking about. I'm a little surprised he said that. But look, Draymond and Ben Simmons, yeah, they're nominally similar players, right? They're non-shooters. They're pass-first guys. They seem to get in each other's way. I get why people on the surface don't think that's a fit. But like everything else in Golden State, Klay Thompson ties everything together. If Klay Thompson gets back to 90% of what he used to be, you start talking about lineups with Steph, Klay, another perimeter player, not a center, not a lane-clogging center, another perimeter player, Simmons and Draymond at center, you combine those kind of genius playmakers with that kind of shooting, that lineup can be pretty powerful. You put a lane-clogging center in there, a Kavon Looney, a James Wiseman, or whatever, all of a sudden the spacing gets all screwed up. But I think people are a little too quick to say Simmons and Draymond couldn't play together. In the right context, I think they could because they're not just good defensive players. They're great defensive players, and they're not just good passers. They're great passers. They can make some magic together if the pieces around them are right. Kirk, your thoughts. Hey, Cassidy, can you can, – no, can you repeat the question? Because once Zach started talking that foolishness <laughs> about – that Ben Simmons and Draymond could work together. I took my earplug sure out did. my ear so I didn't have this to listen to it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> well, okay, first, <laughs> you did want to jump in on your reaction to Joe Lacob even saying this. So let's start there, and then we'll get into Draymond and, and Simmons. All right. Well, you know what? I actually, I actually love him coming out because we are, what, <laughs> 10 days away from training camp, and, and and I think the Golden State Warriors are in a great place right now. They got Klay Thompson returning in a few months. James Wiseman is returning. They did extremely well in the draft. You know, they want to build the chemistry. They want to go in with a continuity and not distractions. And you want your players to have a clear head and be able to focus. So I thought that was a great stance uh, uh, by, by the owner taking that stand and saying, you know what, we're good on this situation. We have Draymond, because look, let's think about it. Draymond and Ben Simmons are basically almost the same player. I mean, Ben Simmons is a more athletic version of Draymond. Draymond has become a point forward. That's what Ben Simmons is, and those two would work well together. If a trade was to happen between those guys, Draymond would probably be in that trade. And I said this time and time again, that Draymond Green is the heart and soul of of the Golden State Warriors. Just because he's not the best player doesn't mean that he's not the heart and soul. He is the true definition of culture. Just like when I was with the Oklahoma City Thunder and they had James Harden, Kevin Durant, and Russell Westbrook, you know who the heart and soul of that team was? It was Nick Collison. Like, you don't have to be the best player to be the heart and soul, so getting rid of Draymond would be a stretch for Ben Simmons, I think. Yeah, and look, Joe Lacob, even if it is just because he doesn't want to mix Ben Simmons and Draymond Green, him coming out and saying, you know, we don't really want Ben Simmons does not help Ben Simmons' trade value, which is already low, and his league ranking mm -hmm. has even taken a hit. ESPN's annual NBA rank release continues today with players 50 through 26. Coincidentally, Ben Simmons is at number 28, 12 spots lower than 2020, just behind Brandon Ingram and Jalen Brown and ahead of Russell Westbrook and CJ McCollum. Perk, seeing Simmons and Russ side by side, who would you rather have this season, Simmons or Westbrook? First, first of all, Cassidy, I want to know who in the hell are doing these rankings? <laughs> Who are doing these rankings? You get the because emails, there's no Mark. way that you, you could, could get in, involved in no, this. No, 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 I, no. No, listen. I, I just want to understand. Under, make me understand this. How could you watch last season and watch what Russell Westbrook did when the Washington Wizards were about 1,500 games below 500 and Russell Westbrook averaging another triple-double, getting them to the postseason, and you have the audacity to put Ben Simmons ahead of Russell Westbrook? This man just keep getting disrespected. Russell Westbrook was tearing the league up once he got healthy the second part of the season. Night and day uh, 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 from Ben Simmons, head and shoulders above Ben Simmons. And it's no disrespect to Ben Simmons because I think he's a great player. He just wasn't great last year, and Russell Westbrook was. Look, these either or this guy or that guy questions are, are so dependent on what the team around them is that they're really hard to answer. But 
Perk just said, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, given the last time we saw Ben Simmons, he was taking zero shots in the fourth quarter of any playoff game and passing up dunks to Matisse Thybul. I can't believe I'm saying this, but Perk just said it. If healthy, Russ is getting older, his health is going up and down. So if you're forcing me to answer this question for this coming season, I'm taking youth, health, and the known quantity of Ben Simmons' defense by a hair over Russ. But I'd be thrilled to have any of them on my team. I just trust the health and the youth a little bit more of Ben Simmons. And I know I'm getting defensive player of the year quality defense at every position from him every night. But at the end of the day, both of these players, one might shoot you out of a playoff game and one might like not shoot you out of a <laughs> yeah. playoff game. So it's, it's kind of a tough choice. Perk, did you take your well, piece out again? He definitely, he definitely, he def, he definitely not go shoot you in the playoff game. <laughs> we saw that last year. So, which one would you take? That's I'd true. rather go with Perk's a guy right. that's gonna go down firing than a guy that's gonna go down being scared. Yeah, and and look, what we do know is that Russ is never scared. That's for sure. Uh, make sure to check out the recent mm -hmm. low post where Zach gets into more of the Simmons saga and a preview on the T Wolves this season. Zach, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Cass. Well, Portland High School yesterday, and C.J. McCollum already called himself out Ooh. and said he needs more throwing reps. So you don't have to, Park, all right? <laughs> you don't have yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, that is that is just horrible. Look how he, ugh, that but I is got disgusting. Thinking, who in the NBA would make the best NFL QB? Let's run it back. We start at number five, Kevin Love. He specializes in the full court chest pass, but occasionally dabbles in the overhead dime. You saw that up close. That was a, that was a nice dime, Caster. But the only thing is that you can't throw a football with two hands. That's fair. See, you're you're really literal with this. <laughs> um, you know what? And I appreciate that. Number four, Rajon Rondo, the floor general. Oh, yep, yep. You talk about a, well, who a guy that would make a hell of a quarterback, Rondo would for sure. Absolutely. I mean, he his let alone like his IQ, let alone, but he sees everything. How about number mm, three? You see that? Reigning Rookie of the Year, Lamelo Ball, underhand, sidearm, overhead. Ooh. He has all the throws. Yeah, maybe I, I wouldn't say football for him. Maybe softball, but that was a nice dime though for sure. I mean that, that oh. yeah, he he puts a little extra something on it. That's part of his sparkle, yeah, I think. I mean, you remember when I told you last year he reminded me of Magic Johnson? Yes, I do. What about this guy? Uh, LeBron James led the uh, league in assists two this? seasons ago. You know who this guy is? No, no, I never heard of. <laughs> Pinpoint accuracy <laughs> for the king. He want to look. You know what's the bad part? He want to be a quarterback so I bad. I know, I know. How about our number one guy in the NBA would be Who's the best the quarterback? Big? Nikola Jokic. Give him time, and he'll fella. pick you apart. I mean, he'll be just like Big Ben. I don't know if he'll be able to scramble out the pocket, but he could throw the football. I like these comparisons. Now, look. Here's a look at mm -hmm. all of them in pads. Park. Did we get <laughs> the order right? Why did we use that picture for LeBron? We are so wrong. I, I, I don't know, but Rondo is the right guy for it. <laughs> right, he right there in the middle. Is that Justin Herbert? Right, he would be. Is that Denver? I, what is that? I don't know whose bodies these are, but this is this is not right. Uh, uh, I'm well, gonna, I'm going with Rondo. I'm going with the guy in the middle. Okay, I'm gonna let you sit with that image um, as we pivot to a preview <laughs> of the WNBA playoffs because this game's serious there, which yeah. begin tomorrow night on ESPN two. Oh. So, like, you sit tight there, Perk, because joining me now for for more on the WNBA playoffs is the great LaChina Robinson. Make sure to check out her podcast Around the Rim as she has you covered on all things W, including this postseason. So, first, let's talk about this playoff format, LaChina, which features two rounds of single elimination games before going to a best of five series for each of the last two rounds. First and foremost, are you a fan of this current format? Well, Cassidy, the operative word there is fan. I mean, if you are watching the WNBA playoffs or if you're a member of the media, just kick back, having our popcorn, you love it because you instantly get that game seven vibe, that NCAA tournament win or go home type of pressure. So yes, I absolutely enjoy it. Now, if you are one of these teams or the players, you don't love it because you come in, you have one bad shooting night, you're a little bit rusty, and guess what? You're going home. But for those of us who get to watch, I am really excited about 
this format and kicking off the playoffs on Thursday. Yeah, it's all or nothing. Meanwhile, the Sun and Aces are sitting pretty into the semifinals start on Sunday. But let's get into a game that you're going to be calling on Thursday, and we will see if Diana Taurasi uh, will be there. She's been dealing with an ankle injury for a while now. How worried are you about her availability for the Mercury's playoff matchup against the Liberty? I'm not really worried at all, Cassidy. And I know before everyone goes crazy, we are talking about Diana Taurasi. We're talking about the White Mamba. We're talking about <laughs> arguably the GOAT, right, of mm -hmm. the WNBA. But what we've watched throughout the course of the season is how Skylar Diggins-Smith and Brittany Griner have proven that they can carry this Phoenix Mercury team. I mean, Skylar Diggins-Smith, Brittany Griner, I expect both of them to be first team all WNBA. Skylar's pick and roll with Brit Brittany cannot be stopped. Her defense this year is tougher than ever. She has been on a tear um, since the Olympic break. And then Brittany Griner dump, dunking more often than we've seen. She's been really aggressive at going to the rim. I'm not concerned about the absence of Diane Tarazi in this first round game. The other thing that Phoenix has on their side is their supporting cast has gotten better throughout the course of this season. They added Bria Hartley back into the mix. She looks really good. Kia Nurse is shooting the ball better in the second half of the season. So we have seen the Phoenix Mercury get stronger. So they can take a little hit, Diana Tarazi, if she's missing in this first game. But um, they will absolutely need her as the playoffs roll on. Yeah, Phoenix is 7-9 and nine this season when Diana is out. But at, to your point, I don't know if there is an answer across the league to Brittany Griner. So that is definitely a must-see matchup. Our other matchup tomorrow features the Dallas Wings taking on the Chicago Sky. Is there any added pressure on Candace Parker to deliver a playoff victory in her first year with the Sky? There's absolutely pressure, and I wouldn't say it's all on Candace Parker, but it's on the Chicago Sky organization. You don't add a two-time MVP to the roster and um, lose in the first round of the playoffs like they did last year. The hope is your team gets better. However, this does not all fall on the shoulders of Candace Parker. Chicago was 1-8 when Parker was out of the lineup, and in my opinion, they're just too good for that. They've got maybe the greatest passer in the game right now in Courtney Vandersloot. Uh, Kalia Copper is probably their most important player for what she brings on both ends of the floor, defensively, in transition, uh, the number of ways that she can score. You've got Allie Quigley, who has been shooting the ball from the three-point line on fire um, since the Olympic break at 50%. So you've got Dolson, Diamond to Shields coming off of the bench. This cannot all rest on the shoulders of Candace Parker. Now, the concern coming into this game is that Chicago has not played well towards the end of the regular season. So James Wade is hoping that his team can step up their playoff intensity because if they do not, Arike Agumawale mm. and the Dallas Wings, young, wild, and free, <laughs> what I call that team, are ready to step in um, and really excited about their playoff debut and how they will perform. Yeah, not, I mean, look, they may not have WNBA experience, but that team has experience of uh, stepping up when it matters most in the college level, that's for sure. So not only is everything on the line Thursday, it is a star-studded night. Appreciate your insight, LaChina, and for joining us on The Jump. Thanks for having me, Kat. He's been eaten up on the dance floor as a contestant on season 30 of Dancing with the Stars on ABC. Aman Shumpert, welcome back to The Jump to see you guys again well first of all you got robbed by the judges if if you don't advance the nba world is rioting and i'm going to be leading the charge but you look so comfortable out there not sure if tiana coached you up but with that one show under your belt what, what was your first impression of that experience on dancing with the stars um it was a lot of fun i think uh it's just a new space for me i'm always into uh, uh, doing new things and trying new things. Um, I think I got a great coach. Uh, she came up with a great routine. It's something that uh, I think uh, even though I'm not a ballroom dancer, I think uh, she put me uh, in the realm of something that would be comfortable for me on both fronts. So I'm really excited about just having my partner uh, making up all the choreo. Well, even if the ballroom audience didn't take to it, uh, you know, the NBA world certainly did. All <laughs> sorts of current and former players, including LeBron, KD, uh, Richard Jefferson reacted to your performance on social media. Who was the first person that texted you? And did you expect to get that kind of reaction? Um, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you who the first text message was. Uh, I just know a lot of people were hitting me up saying that, you know, a lot of my NBA brothers 
was tweeting and, uh, you know, mentioning it on their Instagram stories. And everybody was really excited because I don't think anybody, uh, anybody has seen a, a, a basketball player do well. I think right now the basketball player, I, I believe we're suffering behind football right now in the Dancing with the Stars world. So we got we to gotta catch up, man. Those football guys is really, really good with their footwork. So um, I'm just trying to, you know, get us in the mix, man. Try and get us in the lineup. <laughs> Look, you're you're multi talented. You're you're a dancer. You're you're a rapper. Of course, you played in the mm -hmm. NBA. How, how did playing in the league help you prepare for this opportunity at all? Um, playing in the league is just about a lot of focus and uh, a lot of just making sure that you have the commitment to what you want to do. Um, in the league, a lot of the things that I do is all footwork. Uh, people trust me to guard the best player. And uh, I have to be able to match their footwork and understand what they're trying to get accomplished at all times. Um, you know, I always joke around my teammates about having the best hands in the business. So if you put those two together, man, I should be able to dance a little bit. Man, I should be able to, <laughs> I should be able to move. I got to work on it. You know, the tango sauce, all that stuff, I'm going to have to work on it. You know what I'm saying? I, ain't, I don't got all them zesty moves, but <laughs> I'll get yeah, I'll get that. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you'll get there. You're learning. It's a whole week process. I know you're putting in the work. Um, speaking of teammates, you were teammates with two of our current teammates here on the jump, Richard Jefferson and, and Big Perk, who is watching. Who was the better teammate in your mind? Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say uh, a better teammate. Uh, I think that they were both great teammates. Um, both of them, of course, being older than me, me being a fan of both of them, uh, outside looking in, being outside the NBA, uh, uh, being younger and just seeing those guys as I'm coming up to be on the same team as them. I don't think they understand how much I appreciated taking direction from them, uh, how much I appreciated uh, them giving me jewels even when they're not in the forefront. It was times RJ didn't play for long periods of time. Perk didn't play for long periods of time. And they're still giving me jewels on how I can be better. Um, and that just helps you to be a better professional. Uh, not even if you're not raising the level on your game at the moment. You're constantly working on yourself as a professional. You're constantly working on yourself as a man. And I think both of those guys do a great job at instilling that in their young players. Speaking of uh, taking direction, Iman, um, we know you're in a house full of women. Uh, and we get, we get a... <laughs> you know, close up look at that on your reality show with your family. Um, you and your wife, Tiana, may be the stars, but it's your two girls who are the real stars in the family. How's it been going on that reality show for you? Um, I mean, it's, we filmed it a while ago. So, I mean, it's for me, it's more about the crowd reactions and the fans telling me, you know, how they resonate with, you know, our little family that we started, man. I think, uh, me and Tiana have, you know, just sort of been figuring it out in front of everybody. Uh, we're not perfect. We don't, don't do things, you know, correct. I don't think there is a, a correct way to do parenting. And I think being transparent uh, with that on TV uh, might be some of the best, I mean, sorry, <laughs> the best stuff for TV because uh, right now we just have so much stuff that, uh, Maybe we, we force a little drama. We force a little, you know, chaos. Uh, we feed into it. I wouldn't even say forced. We as the, the fan base usually feed into it. And um, it's cool to dive into something positive, even something that's small negative. It's like it's positive because it's a reflection of, you know, a, norm a normal thing that a family goes through. I think uh, we just try and be as transparent as possible and show the world, like, we're not doing it right either. But we hope that we could do it with a lot of love. And I think that's what ref you get that reflection from our daughters, which makes them the stars of the show, man. Like they don't have anything but love to present. They do everything pure hearted and uh, they come with a smile, man. Anytime you have that, it could be a good show. Iman, as a, as a parent myself, there's no right way to do it. It's just, it's just about all. love. <laughs> it's just about love. And I'm sure they love you on Dancing with the Stars. Don't miss it. Mondays, 8 Eastern on ABC. Make sure to vote. Thanks for joining us on The Jump, Iman. Thanks for having me. All right, this just in. The Wolves have dismissed their general manager, Gerson Rosas. And I want to bring in Kendrick Perkins and Ramona Shelburne, who, joined me, who joins me in studio for more on this. And Momo, I want to start with you. 
Ooh, why did this happen and why now? Oh, I think Carl Anthony Towns' uh, reaction there sums up the collective response around the NBA. Um, Gerson Rosas was in the gym this morning. He was in the gym this morning with the team in Minnesota. Um, I don't think a lot of people saw this one coming, uh, although they have a new ownership group there now. And from what I've been gathering in the last 10, 20 minutes since this happened, um, this wasn't as a big a surprise amongst those who have been in communication with the new ownership group. That's Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez. Now, that statement is from Glenn Taylor. That's the current owner slash old owner. But they have a very complicated uh, ownership transition that's starting to take place. Mark Laurie's group owns, bought 20% of the team this spring. They get another 20% after the 2022 season, and then the final 20% after the 23 season. So there's a transition over the next two years. So you see Glenn Taylor is the statement there, but this is really the new ownership group. Hmm. You know, you get a new boss, and uh, there's it's not always all that surprising when the new boss wants to hire his own people. And from what I understand, Cassidy, Mark Lurie has already reached out to other front office candidates to take over this job. has been sort of quietly reaching out behind the scenes. It's really a, a, a stunning move because of where the Timberwolves are right now in the middle of this Ben Simmons discussion. Uh, they are one of the teams that have been active in trade conversations with the Sixers for Ben Simmons. Uh, the, I, I thought if Ben Simmons moves before training camp starts or during training camp, they were the most likely destination because they're the most motivated team with the best draft assets. Uh, so <laughs> who's going to be running the team? Uh, they have, a, as, as you can tell, everybody's, everybody's a little caught off guard. Carl Towns and yeah. your franchise players tweeting that five yeah. minutes after decision. Perk, with, with Kat tweeting WTF, I mean, what does that say to you? Well, I mean, it means that he didn't know, but he don't have to know. And this is a learning lesson for him. But a guy that, that mm. played for 14 years, a guy that got drafted in 2003 by the Boston Celtics, I watched that happen in Boston. A new ownership group came in, and they hired Danny Ainge. They want to hire some. When they come in, they want a whole new beginning. They don't want guys that's already been there. They want to hire guys that they think could, could, could move in the direction that they want them to move, and that's uplifting that program. We, we can't lie. I mean, Minnesota has been at the very bottom for a while now, and it's time for, for new life. And, you know, even last year, I questioned uh, 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 Rose's hire when he hired his good friend mid midseason, Chris Finch. And I'm not saying that, you know, he's not capable of being a head coach, but, you know, he passed up on David uh, Vanderpool, who was right there, usually the associate coach who had a great relationship with all those guys over there. Usually they move up and get an opportunity. And he passed up on a lot of guys that were already out there that he could have picked up that could go in there and actually speak their language. Now, I'm not knocking Coach Finch right now because I don't know if he's capable of doing it, but this should be no surprise to the world, nobody else. This happens. When new ownerships take over, usually they bring in new people. To something of note, our Bobby Marks just tweeted this out in two weeks. Gerson Rosas was allowed to make the Patrick Beverly trade, uh, bring back yep. Jared Vanderbilt, Jordan McLaughlin, and sign first-round pick Leandro Balmaro. Now, six days before training mm. camp, Minnesota's looking for a new head of basketball operations. So. But, Cass, you know what the big, the important point on this timing is? Minnesota's on the doorstep of potentially trading for one of the most impactful players in the league that you can go trade for right now. Um, they're, they're in these discussions, and if your ownership about that is going to be taking over and paying those salaries and having that team, you want your guy making that trade if, if indeed they go through with this. Um, and, and uh, you know, I don't know what this does to the current state of negotiations because I, I just – I, I'm, I'm, I'm stunned at the timing of this because of how much people in Minnesota were preparing as if this is what they had going into the season. I mean, as of this morning, Gerson Rosas was in the gym with guys in Minnesota working out, talking player development, talking culture building. I mean, th this definitely caught him and others there by surprise. And yeah, training camps open next week. All right, as we head to break here, okay, to celebrate, we're asking, what's your favorite NBA fall? Like your favorite ankle breaker, if you will. What is it? Ooh, it's a lot to choose from. I have not seen a lot in my day, but I got to go with James Harden right there. Look the what stare. he did to Wesley. Oh, my God. He had him doing the the stanky leg <laughs> and then stepped back and gave him and so, stepped back and gave him the pause and dotted his eye. He, he gave classic. him like, oh, bless your heart. It was so, 
You know what? I, I looked at all of the ankle breakers, and I, I, I think mine is, uh, this is my favorite fall. <laughs> you. Oh, Out. they just, oh, y'all didn't have to do that. Yes, we y'all did. Y'all didn't have to do that. This Look, is, this is just, you just see the last road? month. You want to see the, you want to see a dead body? <laughs> there, there it is. Was the workout yeah, that hard, Yeah, there it go right there. Couldn't be that hard. Yeah, I, I, I mean, look, when you trying to get back into things, you can't.